Um, good morning, everyone. I understand there are some issues with the AV. I did not animate my name or anything like that. Is that how the projector appears to be working? Um, I'm not making a lot of use of color, so maybe this is okay. Is this good or am I too loud? Okay. Um, okay, good morning. So I'll be presenting our work on the FTPM, which is a software-only implementation of a TPM chip. The acronym TPM stands for Trusted Platform Module. The F in FTPM stands for firmware, because this TPM implementation is running at the firmware layer of a mobile device. The FTPM has been shipped on millions of mobile devices running Windows. The FTPM, as Cynthia said, is a, was a large project, and many uh, researchers from Microsoft Research in Redmond and many engineers from the Windows group at Microsoft participated. Um, I should also mention again and acknowledge that this project was done in cooperation with three SOC, SOC, System on Chip Vendors, NVIDIA, Qualcomm, and Intel. The use of TPMs in industry and research community is growing. For example, operating systems built by Google and Microsoft offer security features that rely on TPMs. Also, the research community has put forward a multitude of systems using TPMs, from cloud systems to new security primitives like trusted sensors. However, most smartphones and tablets lack TPM chips today. There is nothing incompatible between TPM chips and smartphones and tablets. You can definitely put, uh, equip a smartphone or a tablet with a TPM chip. However, TPM chips were never designed to meet the uh, power constraints, the space constraints, and the cost constraints of mobile devices. Although proposals for changing the TPM specification to meet these new requirements in the mobile space do exist, they never really took off in practice. However, in re recent years, commodity CPU architectures have started to offer built-in features for trusted computing, such as Trust Zone on ARM or Software Guard extension on SGX. Um, this extension offers runtime environments that are isolated from the rest of the system running, um, such as the operating system applications and firmware. With this feature, CPU manufacturers are aiming at making it possible to build trusted hardware that offers security equivalent to that of secure systems. Is this, this good? Yeah. Unfortunately, there is a big problem. While runtime isolation is important, these CPU features omit many of the resources present on this dedicated trusted hardware, such as storage, clock, counter, or entropy. So the question now becomes uh, uh, whether, so these omissions raise an important question. Can we overcome the limitations of commodity CPUs to build software system with security guarantees similar to that of trusted hardware? In the remainder of this talk, we will answer this question positively by describing how we built a software-only implementation of a TPM chip on ARM Trust Zone. Before I continue, I also like to present what we think are the three main contributions of this work. First, we describe three approaches that we use to build ship software that um, uh, is able to bypass the limitations of ARM Trust Zone. We think these approaches were not useful just for the FTPM, but they're useful for anyone building production level quality on, on commodity CPU features today such as Amtra Zone or Intel SGX. Second, we contrast the security of the FTPM to that of a TPM chip. And third, uh, the FTPM is a successful trusted system uh, deployed and running in practice on, uh, in many Microsoft Surfaces and Windows phones. In fact, if you buy today a Microsoft Surface that runs on ARM, it, it contains the FTPM inside. And many of the Intel chip, uh, uh, Microsoft Surfaces running Intel contain FTPM, but not all of them. Okay, this is the outline of my talk. It's a fairly long outline. I just give you, I was bumbling through some motivation. Um, next, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, unfortunately, this talk, I have to spend a little bit of time presenting the background work in order to sort of take away the, the contributions. So the, there are two, and there are two sort of areas of background work. There is the background on the TPM, and there is background on ARM Trust Zone. And I'm gonna spend a little bit of time covering those. Then I'm gonna go and present to you the high-level architecture of, our, uh, of, of the FTPM and tell you some examples of how we are able to overcome the, the limitations of uh, trust zones. Finally, I'm gonna wrap up with performance and conclusions. So background on TPMs. Trusted platform module is a secure coprocessor meant to act as a hardware root of trust. TPMs offer a small set of primitives that provide a high degree of security assurance. First, they offer strong machine identities. A TPM is provisioned with a public-private key pair in such a way that the private portion of the key pair never leaves the TPM chip. Um, such a key can effectively act as a globally unique, unforgeable mach machine identity, and that's useful in a number of scenarios. 
Additionally, TPMs can prevent undesired software rollbacks. They can offer isolated and secure storage of credentials on behalf of users and applications. <clears throat> and they can attest the identity of the software running on the machine. Although TPMs are more than a decade old, we're seeing a resurgence of TPMs by both the industry and the research community. TPMs have had a mixed history, in part to the initial perception that the primary use of TPMs would be to enable DRM, digital rights management, and TPMs were really seen as a mechanism for corporations to force users to give up control of, of their machines. Over time, however, TPMs have been able to overcome their mixed reputation, reputations, and both industry and the research community have put forward useful systems that make use of the TPMs. This has made TPM chips very common in practice, especially on enterprise hardware, but not only. Now, I don't have time to cover all the cool systems that use TPMs that have been shipped out there, both in industry and, and, and proposed by the research community. Uh, if you're interested, uh, please read our paper. This slide is a brief history of TPMs. Again, I won't cover this. Um, the, the two points I want to make is that the current specification of TPMs is 2.0. Although most TPMs deployed in practice, and there are you know, hundreds of millions of them, are 1.2, although right now we're at the cusp where there are more TPM 2.0 uh, platforms being shipped than 1.2. <clears throat> okay, so what's new in 2.0? The FTPM, by the way, uses the 2.0 specifications. There are three new things at a high level. One is 2.0 offers newer cryptography, including ECC elliptic curve. Second, and perhaps most importantly, is that we now have a reference implementations. In the past, Every TPM, especially with 1.2, was slightly different than another one because the specification was in English and English is ambiguous. Now, a hardware vendor can run the, ref <clears throat> can run the reference implementation and disambiguate. And finally, TPMs accept policies that dictate under what conditions they, they should decrypt data or verify data signatures. And these policies are much more flexible in 2.0 than in 1.2. Okay, now, so that was TPMs. Now, trust zone on ARM. ARM Trust Zone is ARM's hardware support for trusted computing. With ARM Trust Zone, the software stack can switch between two states, referred to as worlds. One world on the left is called the normal world, and the other one is called the secure world. These worlds are, these worlds are strongly partitioned, and you can think of them as virtual processor backed by hardware access control. And I'm going to describe this figure. Sorry for the colors. Again, it's not my fault. I'm actually a little nervous about these things blinking in my back here. Um, I'm going to try to explain it by animating a little bit. So when you boot the ARM platform, the SOC, the hardware first powers up, then the processor enters a mode called secure, code, uh, secure monitor layer. In this mode, the software can, provide, can provision the two worlds. For example, it can allocate memory to the secure world and strongly uh, isolate it from the normal world. So the normal world, so you take your RAM and you sort of partition it. And the normal world, the operating system doesn't even know that there is this extra RAM and that there is this other system running uh, side by side. Uh, this memory isolation, this memory partitioning is referred to as curtain memory. The CPUs now have two separate banks of registers for the two worlds, and a special register determines what world the processor is in. Each world has access to only its register sets, and only the secure code monitor layer has access to the both uh, register files. The secure world is then booted. Now the code running in the secure world runs before any code in the normal world has got the chance to run. And that's very important. That's sort of, again, key to the security guarantees. At some point, the, normal, the secure world yields, and then the normal world runs, and the code gets now. So now here is the operating systems, uh, things like Windows, for example. And then we can switch back and forth between the two worlds. Note that no two worlds run at the same time. They run one, they take turns. So to summarize the ARM Trust Zone properties, the isolated runtime boots first and provides curtain memory. All interrupts are delivered to the secure monitor layer, which can then dispatch them to the appropriate world. So with this feature, you can build secure I.O. or secure peripherals. And this ability to map interrupts to the secure world, it's specific to ARM Trust Zone. SGX does not have this ability, and that's actually, in, my, in our opinion, a limitation of SGX. OK, ARM Trust Zone suffers from several limitations. The trust zone specification is silent on trusted storage. One could naively imagine you can encrypt all your data and store it on any regular form of untrusted storage. You can do that, but where do you store the encryption keys? Where do you put those? Second, there is no secure counter. Yes, we can encrypt the data, but encryption alone does not prevent uh, rollback attacks. How do you actually prevent against rollback attacks? You need a secure counter. Third, there is no secure clock 
and four, there is no secure source of entropy, and the FTPM needs all these resources. And what's important here, <clears throat> the reason why I think this is important is not that the FTPM needs resor these resources. These are the resources we use whenever we have to build any systems useful in practice. You need storage, you need a secure counter, you need a secure form of entropy to create randomness, and so on and so forth. Before moving on, I'd like to mention two more things that make it uh, challenging to actually write systems on ARM Trust Zone. There is no virtualization support. ARM provides virtualization, but there is nothing in the Trust Zone specification that says your SOC must have virtualization enabled. And the lack of virtualization makes it difficult to write a piece of software stack that sits side by side with a legacy operating system because there is no context that you can save back and forth. There is no help from the hardware to do that. So yes, you can actually build systems, but they require a lot of engineering, and a lot of engineering is expensive and also comes with a lot of bugs, which is, you know, defeats the purpose in the first place. The last thing I want to mention is the lack of accessibility of ARM Trust Zone. Uh, it's very difficult to get, although all your ARM devices in your, in your pockets right now do offer ARM Trust Zone, all of them, um, they're not enabled, and it's very hard to actually have the hardware OEMs enable them. They're reluctant to do that. Um, ourselves to benefit benefited from the relationships Microsoft has with the uh, SOC vendors to actually get access to the Trust Zone. Okay, Whew. so that was the background. Okay, now I'm gonna present the high-level FTPM and thread model, and then I'm gonna tell you a couple of cool, cool ideas that we used. This is a high-level diagram of the FTPM architecture. The bottom layer is the ARM hardware, and we then have a number of layers that build a very small trusted execution environment, or, or a T. We want this T to be as small as possible because we, don't, we haven't verified it, and the only way we know to actually make sure it doesn't have bugs is to reduce its code complexity. So here, all the layers that are actually slightly darker, they're all the TCB of the system. By the way, the small box, the commodity OS, that's by far, in terms of numbers of lines of code, it's just you know, probably on the order of four orders of magnitude bigger than the code on the right-hand side. So this figure is not to scale. I also like to mention that hardware resources such as graphics, uh, regular network, regular storage, sound, they all map to the normal world, not the secure world, and we do that for performance reasons, and I'm gonna actually come back to this point. Okay, thread model. What threads are in scope, what threads are not in scope? Uh, it's, con it's important here to contrast the thread model of the firmware TPM with that, with the, with that of a discrete TPM. A discrete TPM is a TPM chip. Um, at least six attacks here on the left-hand side, six goals, uh, there are more in the paper. Please read the paper if you're interested in a more detailed th uh, thread model. The first and most obvious attack is that of malicious software running on the machine. We can certainly assume that we can have malware, malicious operating systems that makes incorrect calls. It tries to inject exceptions or errors or tries to corrupt the storage. All of these are fair game. That's the whole point of the TPMs in the first place. Next attacks that are in scope are time-based side-channel attacks. Um, here, what we do, we leverage the, um, uh, the, uh, the TPM uh, code base, which goes to great lengths to ensure that its code paths are constant time. Uh, all the cryptography being used is constant time, and some, there, there are some other mechanisms in place for making sure things are constant time. Next one are cache-based cache side-channel attacks. Here, Trust Zone has provisions for thwarting side, uh, 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 cache-based side-channel attacks, um, and no such attacks have been demonstrated in practice at least yet. Um, now, the more interesting part, the things that are out of scope, denial of service. So in order to get access to the TPM, whether it's a TPM chip or a firmware TPM, you have this big operating system in the middle, and the OS clearly can refuse to give you access to the TPM. Um, uh, so they are out of scope. And what this means here is that the TPM and the firmware TPM, they remain secure. They protect their secrets, but they cannot make forward progress. And there is nothing we can do about it as long as we have this big malicious thing in the middle, okay? But, but they remain secure, that's the important part. Uh, power analysis side-based channel attacks. Um, power analysis are these attacks where you bring an antenna to measure the amount of uh, uh, electromagnetism ca coming from your electronics. If you have the expenses and the sophistication to mine these side channel attacks, TPMs were never really designed to protect against these attacks. We're worried about them, but for this talk, they're out of scope. Finally, memory attacks. These are the more interesting ones, actually. The FTPM store all its state in memory, in RAM. So now, things like call boot, bus sniffing, or JTAG attacks are in scope. And these are of concern, because you basically can steal the FTPM secrets by mounting these attacks. 
I should add here that ARM Trust Zone does not encrypt its memory contents. HGX does encrypt its memory contents. So before I was telling you about the disadvantage of HGX, the fact that you don't have interrupts, here's an advantage of HGX, which is it encrypts its memory. Trust Zone does not do that. Um, we are worried about these attacks, and we uh, actually have a number of techniques that are generalizable to all ARM platforms to prevent these attacks. We actually published a paper not about the FTPM, but about how to prevent or how to protect against these attacks at ASP Plus last year. Um, you should read that if you're interested. Okay, so now the contributions. We use three approaches to overcome the trust zone limitations. The first thing we can do is we can go to the SOC vendors, the NVIDIAs and the Qualcomms of the world, and we can mandate them that they should put on their SOCs all these hardware resources. And this is very difficult in general for two reasons. The first one is economics. SOC vendors uh, operate on very low margins, as you know, and they want to have a very small bill of materials uh, at the end of the day. The second, and that's sort of interesting, but the second reason is actually more interesting, which is much more fundamental. It's very difficult because there are physical processes, in, physical process limitations in place that prevent us from placing storage, flash storage, or a secure counter on a small and hot surface like that of a processor, that of a chip. Okay, so sort of physics gets in the way. You can't do that. However, we've made a number of helpful observations. First, ARM comes with a huge ecosystem out there of hardware vendors, and this actually played in our favor because they all try to differentiate themselves. Unlike HGX, in the HGX world, the only SOC or the only vendor is Intel. Um, here you have all these vendors you can work with, and it turns out that there is this controller called an EMMC storage controller that has provisions for trusted storage and is present on many ARM socks, and I'm going to talk about it a little bit. The second thing is that there are these things called secure fuses. A secure fuse is a register where you write once, you literally burn a fuse to write it, and then you can always read it. And what we do is we provision these fuses with randomness. This randomness is, is different for every single device in the world, and we use these randomness to derive crypto keys. And then it turns out you can also add entropy sources. That's actually uh, sort of a, an interesting thing. Now let me spend the one slide to describe EMMC. With EMMC, you can set up, so EMMC is a storage controller for accessing your storage. It's not, there's nothing special about it, but it has these security extensions, it turns out. It's a sort of an arcane, interesting fact that we took a great advantage of. You can set, you can set up a, a partition on, a, on, a, on your EMMC storage as an RPMB, or replacement protected memory block. And this RPMB partition has a useful number of primitives. It has a one-time programmable authentication key. So what the FTPM does, it takes the randomness from the secure fuse, it generates cryptographic keys, and injects them into this EMMC controller once. That is done before the device actually is even shipped to the user, to the consumer. So it's done through some process where we actually have some mechanism in place to make sure that it cannot be taken advantage of. Um, it also has support for authenticated reads and writes. Uh, it uses a set of internal counters. It has support for nonces to help you with the freshness of reads. So that was nice. Okay, so here's what we did. The combination of the EMMC and secure fuses addressed the first two limitations. We now have secure counters, and we have secure trusted storage. The source of entropy addressed the source of entropy, straightforward. And finally, we used a combination of a timer and a slight change in the semantics of a TPM command to build a secure clock. And I don't have time to present this in, the, uh, in this talk. It's in the paper. It's a couple of tricks we use. And they were a little conf I found that they were a little confusing to present them in a talk, so I sort of skipped. And instead, I'm going to focus on the other th tricks that are actually much simpler and more straightforward. OK, so we used three approaches. I told you about we went to the SOC vendors and say, hey, you can put an EMMC controller, give us a secure fuse, and give us a secure form of entropy. Um, and we did that. But we used two other approaches. We made design compromises in the TPM. This was a trick that we took advantage of. And then we changed the semantics of, of some of the TPM commands. And whenever we, you do this, you have to be very careful to not uh, weaken the security of the TPM because, yeah, then you defeat the purpose. So let me give you a couple of examples of how we did this. I'm going to start with the design compromise. One of the problems is long-running commands. So let me describe the design requirements. Coding the running in the secure world must be minimal. For example, the T <clears throat> lacks preemptive scheduling, so we can't really switch back and forth very quickly between, between the two worlds. What this means is that whenever we run an FTPM command, the operating system freezes to a first approximation. And uh, we want to make sure that these uh, periods of time in which the OS is frozen, they're not very long. 
Well, it turns out that creating RSA keys, which is one of the TPM operation, can take over 10 seconds on slower mobile devices. And freezing the operating system, like Windows, for more than hundreds of milliseconds is problematic because while the OS is frozen, the interrupts get queued, the queue uh, eventually overflows, you start losing interrupts, your things don't work properly anymore. To give you a simple example, MP3 doesn't work properly or it doesn't sound good when you start losing interrupts coming from your uh, uh, audio device. We certainly don't want a smartphone that starts to distort your music whenever somebody uses the FTPM in the background. Um, so the solution we devised here is based on cooperative checkpointing. So whenever you have a long-running command, the, TP, the FTPM checkpoints its state and yields back to the normal world. And it's now the job of the OS, even though the OS is malicious, it's the job of the OS to actually resume these commands if it wishes to do so, or it can issue cancel commands. So in this way, we make sure that the OS is never frozen for more than a, hundreds of couple of, for more than a couple of hundreds of milliseconds. Finally, let me give you an example of how we change the semantics of a TPM command. TPM unseal. Unseal is a TPM command where an authorization is shown to the TPM in order for the TPM to decrypt an encrypted blob. And you can think of this an authorization uh, like a PIN number. You can think of this, of this authorization like a PIN number that the user enters. BitLocker, uh, which is one of the uh, Windows features, makes great use of these PIN numbers, but not just BitLocker. Google has a number of systems like this as well. Um, the TPM uses a mechanism called anti-hammering, whose goal is to stop an attacker attempting to guess the PIN number. The idea is to have a counter that records the number of tried and failed attempts. It is important for this counter to persist to the trusted storage. Otherwise, if the counter were to be volatile, then an attacker can simply reboot the machine and reset the counter or roll back the counter. And what the point of this diagram here is that we, we store on trusted storage the failed attempt counter before we return back to the user. And at some point, if you exhaust the number of tries, trials, the TPM enters a period called lockout. During lockout, the TPM refuses to answer commands anymore. And lockouts are long periods of time in the orders of hours. The goal of anti-hammering, which is what this mechanism is called, is to slow down an attacker that attempts to guess pin numbers. However, with the FTPM, we have a problem that, it's, that we refer to as a dark period. A dark period is one where storage is unavailable. The danger during a dark period is that TPM unsealed commands are not safe because the attacker can simply reboot the machine. An example of a dark period occurs during the boot cycle of, of your mobile device at a time where the firmware, or for those of you who are ARM savvy, the UEFI, the firmware sort of finishes booting up and unloads itself. The contract between an operating system and the firmware is that only one set of drivers is present and managing a device at any single point in time. The contract is that once UEFI is done doing its stuff, it's going to unload this driver, and now the operating, operating system takes over. And during this period of time, you have a dark period, storage is unavailable, and you have to issue an unsealed command because that's how you actually release the authentication keys from the TPM to go decrypt your operating system. It's exactly when TPM unseal is used during one of these dark periods. There are other examples of dark periods other than this. Let me, uh, going back to this timeline, this is the same timeline that, than before. We just enter a dark period here early on. We don't have trusted storage anymore, so that's what the X over that counter of failed attempts means. Um, and the attacker can simply reboot the machine and force the FTPM to never enter lockout. And this means that the FTPM's anti-hammering mechanism is useless. So the solution here was to modify the semantics of how TPM 2.0 interprets the, this counter. And for this, we introduce a dirty bit. Before entering the dark period, we write this bit to storage. When the machine exits the dark period, we clear this dirty bit. However, it's possible that the machine reboots while this bit is dirty and present dirty on our storage, but we don't have drivers. And there are two possibilities. Either there is a legitimate user that happened to just reboot its platform in the middle of this, one of these dark periods, or an attacker is trying to actually reboot the machine to guess the pin number. We just can't distinguish between the two possibilities. Which one is it? And the solution here was to be conservative from a security standpoint and assume an attacker no matter what. The solution then is to always enter lockout when you reboot during a dark period. So to illustrate the dirty bit in action, this is the same timeline as before, except that the right-hand side, we, don't, we cannot store the failed attempts counter, but the right-hand side, if, we end, if the machine rebooted, we always enter lockout. OK, performance. We use seven different devices with different TPMs in our methodology. This table lists the seven devices. The first four one are ARM, smartphones, and tablets. 
Um, these smartphones and tablets are sort of generic ones. You can go walk into your next wireless carrier store and buy them. Probably some of you actually run them in your pockets. There's nothing esoteric about these devices. Um, the last three are discrete TPM devices or TPM chips. And we instrumented that profile, the number of TPM commands. We have a lot of data in a technical report. If you're interested in to how to find out about our technical report, we have a link in our paper. OK, what this graph shows is the performance of encryption and decryption of 32 bytes of data using RSA 2048. On the x-axis, you have the seven devices. The first four are FTPMs. The last three are discrete TPM chips. The y-axis measures the duration of a TPM command in milliseconds. And the takeaway point here is that it's, FTPM is much, much faster than the discrete TPMs. And there is nothing, this is not surprising. There is nothing, it's not that the discrete TPMs are dumb or, or it's just that a TPM chip has a, con, a microcontroller inside and doing crypto on microcontrollers is damn slow. Here we do crypto on the ARM SOC core, which is much, much faster. So we just have much better hardware than they, than they do. What's cool here, the point that I want to come across is that with FTPMs, you can now, so, so until now, whenever an application needs to run encryption, it relies on the operating system to actually sort of manage the encryption keys and do encryption. Now, if, uh, TPMs are fast enough that you can do encryption and decryption for most of your needs through the FTPM device. And that's nice because you don't have, you get out of the job of managing your keys. The FTPM device has these provisions where you can create keys, such as the private key never leaves the TPM chip, and that's nice. You don't, cannot lose it, and so forth. Okay, so this is the conclusion slide. Uh, FTPM leverages ARM Trust Zone to build a TPM 2.0 running in firmware. We took three approaches, and we think these are useful for anyone building trusted systems in practice. We uh, looked for additional uh, trusted hardware. We made some design compromises, and we made some changes to the semantics of the commands. And the last point I want to communicate is that the FTPM is much, much faster than their discrete counterparts, and you can use it for cool things. Um, thank you. That's it. I have a slide on discussing HGX limitations. If you are interested, ask me questions. I'm kind of out of time. OK. OK. Well, Victor, are you here? Paul has a question. OK. So you come up and start getting ready, and uh, we'll take some questions. I think this is a great work, and uh, I'm, I'm glad you had a chance to share it with us. Um, a question about some earlier research you've done. Does this uh, substantially change the support level for um, trusted sensors, or can you say something about how this impacts that? Um, so it, it does not. Um, the, the goal, it, this maybe didn't come across. The goal of the FTPM is to be as compatible with, with, a, with a regular TPM chip as possible. Um, and in fact, uh, Windows doesn't even know it's running on top of the FTPM. Whenever it looks for a harder resources, the FTPM answers and says, hey, I'm a TPM chip. And Windows has no idea that, in fact, it's f uh, firmware running in the TP uh, TPM running in the firmware. So it does not change only any of the features in, 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 legacy, in Windows, at least. Uh, Windows are not, does not offer support for trusted sensors. Um, and uh, trusted sensors, you probably TPMs are useful, but they're probably not everything you need for building trusted sensors. You probably want to have the ability to map your TPM se your uh, uh, sensor directly into the trust zone. And you probably want to run some sort of sensor dri uh, driver inside there that, that signs your readings. So that's a tougher problem. It's a tougher problem. It, it, it depends on what you mean. So I'll tell you, nobody has built a software stack of, I built a software stack for a trusted sensor. It's nowhere near the, uh, careful uh, design that the TPM software stack uses. So in other words, if, you're, if you want to uh, manage encryption keys, or you want to do seal and unseal, which are sort of useful, TPM is definitely the way to go. It's much more well, well thought out than anything I've seen. Um, is Microsoft, uh, two questions. Is yeah. Microsoft uh, satisfied with the FTPMs as sort of a TPM thing for mobile going forward, or is this seen as a stopgap <clears throat> until hardware TPMs become more um, available? And the, the second one is, uh, well, you can answer that. Yeah, one. yeah, yeah. Go, you want to ask the second, or you want me to answer the first? I just forgot one second. OK. <laughs> so I'll answer your first question, what you think. So your, let me repeat the question. The question was, um, was this a stopgap solution until we have discrete TPMs in practice? Um, Microsoft really is not in the business of dictating the SOC vendors what to do. Uh, my guess is we're not going to have discrete TPMs on smartphones. Uh, uh, real estate is at a premium in the smartphones. 
Uh, I cannot speak on behalf of Microsoft. I can now give you my personal opinion, which is that I don't think we're going to see TPM chips in smartphones anytime soon. Surfaces, on the other hand, we, we do see TPM chips. And the reason for that is because Intel itself is a TPM vendor, and it has TPM chips. However, Intel also has uh, an FTPM running in some of their uh, non, uh, I mean, they don't use ARM on, on, their, on their surfaces. The other one is, are devices being, uh, with FTPMs being, is there a way for, uh, I mean, are they being labeled as having TPMs and the, the end user might not know that they have an FTPM versus a real TPM? Uh, can you repeat? So, the, is your question, does the user, is the yeah, user aware? Are, are, these, are these devices being marketed as having uh, TPMs when, and it might not, it might be difficult to determine if you have an FTPM or a real TPM? Um, uh, I'll tell you, I have no idea how exactly they're marketed, and I'm sure that in the moment, there is a marketing sh a spec uh, sheet out there that probably says it's a TPM, and in fact, it's an FTPM. I don't know. Uh, there are ways, if you're interested in you knowing whether you have an FTPM or a TPM chip, I can tell you about how to do that in Windows. Question? Yeah, yeah, Jay. Quick, quick question. All right, Jay Anjong, Microsoft Research, big fan, uh, great work. So I uh, guess uh, the, the uh, key that you burn into fuses, right? I assume that these, the, that key is uh, accessible to firmware TPM, the entire thing. So how, how, what's your recovery story if that key sort of somehow gets compromised because of a bug in FTPM? Yes, so, um, so, just to, uh, so, so your question was, we, we store keys in the secure fuses. What if the key was were to compromise? What measures do we take to actually uh, do something about it? Um, Good question. Let me thank you for the question. Let me uh, uh, a small clarification. We store a seed in the secure fuse. From the seed, we actually derive keys. Um, there are ways in the TPM specification to uh, to recreate these keys. It's called taking. Whenever there is this operation called taking TPM ownership. Taking TPM ownership basically tells the TPM forget all your keys. Okay, so everything that they encrypted before you cannot decrypt anymore. Please generate new ones. And that's done through a way in which you use that seed uh, and uh, some, some counters that we keep and sort of increment them. If the seed were to be leaked outside of this uh, 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 TCB of the system, we're done. Um, and uh, you can definitely decrypt everything that the TPM encrypts. And hopefully you won't leak. So there are, the, the way to leak the key actually is by reading, is by, um, uh, so the, the seed, it's actually hard to read the seed using memory attacks, but it's a lot easier to read the encryption key using, using memory attacks. And to clear that up, you just take, retake ownership of the TPM. Um, I'm sure it's possible to leak the seed somehow through some sophisticated attack, and I, I'm not aware of anything that we do right now. Yeah. There's one more question no. there with, no, sorry. That's there, it, that's no, 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 there's not enough time. Sorry, I would wish you. We, we've got the, the other The whole point authors. of a conference is this, it's not me talking, it's them talking. Well, you should have talked less. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.